Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. And in this video, having broken Lakstila Saga, the saga of the people of Lakstadal, into two parts, I am going to finish the saga. Now, for saga completists out there, if there is such a thing, and it certainly is in academia, maybe not so much in the uh, wider cultural appreciation of sagas, uh, people will notice that I cut probably the contents of 25, 30 chapters from Lockstill's saga <laughs> and telling this essentialized version of it. That's because the saga is the saga of the people of a particular valley, and so it wanders interminably in talking about the lives of what are, from our perspective, minor characters. We like to have a single direct narrative, maybe with a few digressions about other characters. We don't usually in our narrative sort of tolerate this meandering, especially about characters who have been barely introduced. The last part of Loxdala Saga is really bad about that from our perspective. Not bad from their perspective. Again, they're chronicling the lives of people of a particular district. But for us, the main gist of the story is in the first half, Hoskold and his son Olaf Peacock, and then in the second half, it's about Kjartan and his foster brother, Bully. So to pick up, Kjartan is the son of Olaf Peacock, but Olaf Peacock is also uh, fostering his, um, what would that be, half-nephew, uh, Bully. Now, there are some signs early on that there may be dissension between these two. Um, Olaf Peacock has a bull that has, in addition to the normal two horns, also kind of a triceratops horn on its nose. The triceratops horn falls off and Olaf Peacock slaughters this bull, but that night he has a dream that an old woman uh, berates him for killing the bull and says that for killing her son, he will also see his own son die. And remember, dreams and prophecies in these sagas almost always come true, so <laughs> this is not just an idle dream. And then also there is a uh, prophet in the area, a certain Gestr, who on one occasion watches Kjartan and Boli swimming together, and Olaf Peacock is, you know, just having a good time, I don't know, out in the sun, and Gestr starts crying, and Olaf asks him why, and he says, I have foreseen Bully standing over Kjartan's corpse. So this is some pretty heavy foreshadowing. And Kjartan, for his part, grows up, and when he's 18, he falls in love with a local girl named Guthrun. Now, Guthrun has been married before. In fact, when she was much younger, she had her own encounter with the psychic neighbor Gestr, in which she told him that she had had a dream. And in her dream, she, uh, she had four different treasures in order and she lost them four different ways. So the first time she was she had a headdress, like a fancy uh, woman's headdress, and uh, many people admired it and it was very richly made, but she didn't like it very much and she ended up throwing it away. And then in her second dream she had a, or the second thing in the dream, she had a uh, silver ring, not as fancy as the headdress maybe, but she liked it more but then it fell off her hand into the water and she lost it. And the third thing, she had a golden ring and it fell off of her hand into several bloody pieces and she thought that if she had taken better care of it, it might not have broken up. And the fourth thing is she was wearing a golden helmet and it got too heavy and it fell off of her head into the water and she lost that too. So she asks Gester to interpret this for her and Gester says, well, these are your four husbands. So the first one that everybody liked, but you didn't like so much and you threw away, you're gonna divorce him. That's a man that you're not gonna love as much as people think you ought to. The second one's gonna be a man who's not as wealthy, but he's going to drown. That's the ring that falls into the water. Third one is gonna be a man who gets murdered. And you're gonna wonder if maybe you could have prevented it. And the fourth one is gonna to drown too. <laughs> That's the helmet that falls into the water. Well, like I said, dreams and prophecies in these sagas pretty much uh, a certain currency, so this stuff is going to happen. Uh, anyway, so Guthrun, to go a little bit further into her backstory before she meets Kjartan, uh, when she was pretty young, I think 15, her dad married her without consulting her to uh, her, her, her first husband, 
a uh, Thorvald. Thorvaldr uh, has to, as part of his agreement to marry Guthrun, he has to agree to buy her whatever she wants, and she kind of expresses her resentment toward him passive aggressively by making him buy her lots and lots. And you know, this is medieval Iceland, so he's not buying her cars, he's buying dried fish and stuff like that. And uh, she demands more and more, and uh, he thinks that her demands are unreasonable, and at one occasion he slaps her. And uh, when he has slapped her, she says, ah, now you've given me what women really want, and that's a uh, nice uh, color in our cheeks. So she kind of has her own Schwarzenegger lines here. Um, she starts thinking about how she can divorce him, and assault isn't typically given as a reason. But she's got a neighbor, another guy named Thorther, that she kind of is into, and she's talking to Thorther about how she can divorce Thorvalder. Thorvalder Thorther says, well, you know, women make the clothing in the households. Why don't you make your husband a, an illegal shirt? And indeed, medieval Norse law codes define certain standards for men's and women's clothing, and a man's shirt is considered womanly and thus illegal cross-dressing if, if the neck opening goes below a certain point. So she just makes him a real deep v-neck shirt, and when he puts it on, she declares witness, 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 and she divorces him. Well, at the next thing, law council slash festival, when she runs into Thorther, uh, Thorther says, gosh, you know, I sure wish now that you're single that I could marry you, but I'm still stuck with Alther over here. And Guthrun says, yeah, your wife Alther, isn't she the one that they call Pants Alther? And he says, I, I don't know what you're talking about there. He says, no, isn't she the one that they call Pants Alther? He says, oh, right, right, because she cross-dresses too. So he goes, witness, 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 I divorced my wife Alther for wearing men's pants. And so Thorther and Guthrun are married shortly thereafter. Uh, Thorther does try to kind of soften the blow by not fighting his ex on, uh, on her property too much, unlike some other jerks in the sagas after their impromptu divorces. Uh, but there's a memorable occasion on which uh, when Thorther and his father-in-law, Osfever, are out, um, they're camped out. I think they're making a new house uh, when Guthrun is still back at the old house or something to that effect. Uh, Alther comes riding one night, and the saga says she's definitely wearing pants on this occasion, and she cuts across. She breaks into, the, in, into their tent or whatever they're sleeping in and uh, cuts Thorther across the chest with the sword she's carrying. He doesn't mortally wound him, but, but hurts him. And uh, his father-in-law, Usfefer, offers to ride after her, but Thor, this is no. She did something she had every right to. <laughs> he's, he's, he just really takes it in stride. Time passes and Thorther does indeed drown, although Gudrun does have a uh, son with him named Thorther also, who's born after uh, his father Thorther, the elder Thorther's death. All right, so Gudrun's been married twice by the time that Kjartan meets her. And uh, as a widow, she has more freedom to determine uh, who she might marry. And she and Kjartan are very clearly into one another. And uh, her father and Olaver Peacock Kjartan's father are good friends, so everybody's pretty cool with the notion these two are probably going to hook up. After all, they're both the best-looking people of their respective sexes in Iceland, right? Being saga protagonists. But Kjartan is a young man, wants to go abroad and prove himself, and so he asks Guthrun to wait for him for three years, and she's not really willing. In fact, she asks him to take her with him rather than just leave her in Iceland. And he says, no, that's crazy. I'm not going to take a woman with me. And she says, no, take me with you. It's not Iceland I'm in love with. <laughs> Much more romantic dialogue, actually, in as much as it is romantic dialogue than you'd normally find in a saga. Well, Kjartan ends up leaving with uh, Guthrun staying behind, very dejected. And, of course, he goes with his foster brother and best buddy, Bolli, to Trondheim, Nidaros, the old capital of Norway. And there they find there's many other Icelanders, including a cameo from 
Alfredo Vandraya the Skull, Alfredo the Trouble Poet, who I've made two other videos about. Uh, and these other Icelanders are kind of stuck in Norway because the new king of Norway, Oliver Tryggvason, who is the first missionary Christian king of Norway, won't let anyone go to Iceland who is unbaptized. So these Icelanders are all stuck unless they want to accept any religion. None of them want to. They all agree that Christianity blows, <laughs> which, I mean, they're given no more debt than that. They just don't like this new religion. And uh, so they spend the winter together all agreeing, you know, haha, the new king and his new religion is pretty ridiculous. But the spring comes and everybody in Trondheim is out uh, swimming and trying to drown each other, the Norse swimming contest. And uh, Bully points out to Kjartan, a particularly powerful swimmer and swim wrestler out there in the water. And he says, Kjartan, you really ought to go out and swim compete with this man. So Kjartan takes off his clothes and goes swimming out, dunks his guy's head in the water. And the other guy dunks his head in the water and they both nearly drown each other. Have a good swimming contest <laughs> as the Norse to find these things. And they swim back to shore and... Uh, the man asks Kjartan what his name is, and he says, I, I'm Kjartan Olafsson. Doesn't ask this man what his name is, and they, uh, this man says, don't you want to know who I am? And Kjartan says, nope. And the man says, I'm Olafur Tryggvason, king of Norway. You know, of course he winds up, because they, they have these associations, as we do in a, in a subtler way, that people of higher status are better at things, so of course the king is the best swimmer, swim wrestler of all. But the king offers him his own cloak, and so Kjartan goes back to the Icelanders, and now they're going to kind of make fun of him for quite a while after this for being a little bit too close to this king they've all been making fun of previously, right? Kjartan and Olav are sitting in a tree. B-A-P-T-I-Z-I-N-G. First comes baptismal robes, then comes confirmation, then comes Kjartan with the Eucharist carriage or something like that. And this goes on for a year with every time Oliver Peacock encounters Kjartan, he kind of, he's always real impressed with him and he says, oh man, I wish that man was a Christian. <laughs> that very handsome, very strong, excellent swim wrestler. And so the Icelanders are all, all the other Icelanders make fun of Kjartan. And over the next winter, they do it to such an extent that he says, finally, God damn it, guys. I'm going to burn the king to death in his own house to prove to you that I am not his buddy. Well, the king is spies everywhere. And uh, so some of them tell him that one of the Icelanders said he was going to burn him to death in his house. So the king is all the Icelanders summoned to him. And he says, which one of you said he was going to burn me to death in my own house? I know one of you did. And Kjartan says, well, it was me. I'll confess it. And you probably weren't expecting anybody to confess it. And the king says, yeah, I wasn't expecting anybody to be so brave. <laughs> right? He's got this ridiculous fixation on Kjartan. And, and uh, he says, you know, I just wish men like you, as brave as you are, were part of my company and were saved by the true God. Well, the Icelanders now are turned a little bit more warmly toward Christianity because the king has shown them such grace after this threat. And eventually, after eavesdropping on some of his church services, they all agree to be baptized. And so for the next two years, Kjartan stays in Norway as a close friend, of course, of the king. This is always how this goes in these sagas. And he ends up being pretty close to the king's sister, Ingibjörg. So when Boli goes back to Iceland after they've been out for three years, Kjartan stays behind because he's got it pretty good in Norway. And uh, so Boli goes back to Iceland and brings Guthrun the message that Kjartan's stayed in Norway and seems pretty happy hanging out with Ingibjörg, the king's sister. And uh, Guthrun resentfully says that, well, Kjartan wouldn't be happy unless he had a good woman. And Bully says, yeah, but what would you think about marrying me instead? It gets to the point. And she says, no, I'll never marry any man as long as I know Kjartan's alive. But Bully goes about it the other more indirect route uh, makes his case with her dad and her brothers, says, wouldn't I be a cool brother-in-law, son-in-law? And they all agree he would be. And finally, they pressure Guthrun enough that she gives in. Although she doesn't have to give in as a widow, she has more control, like I said. But she gives in to social pressure and marries Bully while Kjartan is still in Norway. Well, Kjartan eventually does decide to come back, I think after another year. 
And uh, when he sang his goodbye to Ingeborg, the king's sister, she's pretty silent with him, but she says, you know, I've got something I was hoping to wear to my wedding. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but I think it'll do just as well for Guthrie and Oswif's daughter's wedding. And uh, she pulls out this very fancy headdress woven with gold and says uh, that uh, Kjartan ought to take this back to Eisen for his bride. And so he does. But when he gets back to Eisen, of course, he finds out that Guthrun has already married Bolli. And he's resentful, and so is Guthrun, apparently. But he does go to feasts hosted by Bolli. Bolli even offers him four fine horses, but Kjartan says he is Engi Rosa Madre. He's no horse man. <laughs> And he refuses the gifts, which is typically a, um, a sign of tension or even combat to come in the sagas. Well, Kjartan ends up marrying a different woman, a certain Hrevna, a name that I like. It's the uh, uh, female form of Raven, Raven, so it's like woman Raven, Raven woman. And tensions continue to get worse between Kjartan's household and Bully's household. Kjartan's sword given to him by the king disappears one day and is found out in a swamp. And then one day after a feast, uh, the headdress, which Revna wore at her wedding, disappears and is never found again. Kjartan directly confronts Guthrun about it, asking her if she stole it. And Guthrun says, no, I don't know of anyone in my household. Caught it. Guthrun says, no, I don't know of anyone in my household who would have taken it. But if anyone did, I would just say that she was taking what was hers. So Kjartan is mad, and he uh, ends up riding over to Boli and Guthrun's place with 50 men. <sighs> and what he does is he surrounds their house for three days and doesn't let anybody out. What that means is that they can't get out to the outhouse, so they're basically defecating in their own bedroom and kitchen. So this is a truly humiliating act. But Kjartan feels divided about it. When he comes home, Hrevna kind of gloats about it and she says, what did Guthrun look like? And Kjartan says, better than any other woman. <laughs> He's still kind of in love with her. I get it, you know, I guess. Anyway, uh, he also ends up, uh, there's some land that Bully wants to buy from a neighbor. Kjartan ends up underbidding and buying it out from under him. And so finally, Guthrun is ready for Kjartan to die. And so she knows one day after Easter that Kjartan is going to be riding past their farm with just two of his friends, On, Twigbilly, and Thorarin. And so she encourages Bully to take her brothers and two guys called the, the sons of Thorhalla out to kill him. And so they do ambush Kjartan. And... Uh, Kjartan, of course, fights hard. He's barely injured himself, but he gets exhausted. And so he kneels down before his foster brother, Bully, casts his own sword aside and says, Frandy, which is a term of affection for a family member, obviously related to English friend. Frandy, it would be much better to me if you gave me my death than if I gave you yours. So Bully kills him, but cradles his foster brother, Kjartan in his arms as he dies. Now Bully goes home and uh, the first thing at home is Guthrun asks him uh, what time it is and he says it's mid-afternoon and she says oh then our work has been very different. I spun yarn while you killed Kjartan and he says yeah thanks uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have forgotten it even if you didn't remind me and she says well I'm just happy knowing that Revna is not going to go to sleep happy tonight and Bully says yeah well you're probably less happy to know that he's dead than you would have been if he had killed me. But she says, no, actually, I'm very happy knowing that you'll do anything that I ask you to. <laughs> she reminds me a lot of Farah and Robinson Jeffers Cotter, or a little bit of Phaedra, maybe. But uh, now Oliver Peacock does not want revenge taken on Bully because he is his foster son, who he loves like a son, too. So he demands only a fine from Bully, although he does get uh, the, uh, uh, the brothers of Guthrun outlawed, and so they have to leave Iceland. And he allows his other sons, like Steinthor and Haldor, 
to kill um, the sons of Thorhalla who participated in the ambush. But after Olaf Peacock dies, his wife Thorgerder is much less willing to forgive Bully. And she's riding by Bully's place with her sons, uh, Haldor, Stainthor, and the other one whose name escapes me because he's not that important. And she says, hey, who lives in this house? <laughs> and Haldor says, mom, you know who lives in that house? She says, who? who? And he says, oh, it's, it's Bully. And he says, oh, Bully. And what did he do? Oh, he killed my brother. Yes, that's right. And aren't you such nice girls to let him just live in peace in this house so close to your own? It's kind of a saga trope too. women calling men women for failing to uh, perform the violence that they expect from them. And Holder says, okay, mom, we'll go kill him. And so taking his buddy Helgi with him, they go to uh, Bully's house. Bully orders Guthrun and the rest of the household out of the house. He wants to face them alone. It's an honorable decision. But Guthrun picks up some laundry and goes down to the creek to wash it. While these guys come into the house and kill her husband. Uh, Helgi, the friend, uh, stabs him through the guts with a spear while Stainthor, son of Oliver Peacock, cuts off Bully's head. They come outside with their bloody weapons and Guthrun greets them and says, oh, you know what's happened? She's, she's, she's very weird. <laughs> and they say, well, we killed your husband. And Helgi, Haldor's friend, wipes the blood off of his spear on Guthrun's uh, very fine uh, lace dress or shawl. And one of the brothers says, oh, that's a cruel thing to do, but he says, no. And she, she smiles at him while he does it. He says, no, I think my own death lies under that same dress. Well, peace is actually kept for a while now because everyone seems to kind of agree that this is payback for Kjartan. So there's no real reason for more bloodshed between these family members. But 12 years later, Guthrun is still seething about it, even though she wasn't seething when it happened. I guess the crime has grown in her eyes over the 12 years. And uh, she secures a promise from a man named Thorgils to kill Helgi. Uh, she can't get anybody to kill the sons of Olaver because uh, of the esteem for them and the fact that everybody kind of agrees they had a, a right to do this killing. But she gets the Thoriel Sky to agree to kill Helgi if she promises in return that she will marry no one else on Isen. Well, she intends to marry a guy named Thorkel who's in Norway at the time, and he doesn't see through this. Um, as her kinsman neighbor Snorri the Gothi says when he's advising her about this plan, um, Thorkel is more proven in the realm of eagerness than in the realm of intelligence. So Thorgils. Uh, does kill Helgi. Uh, this ends up going on too long. <laughs> it's one of the longest scenes in the saga, and it's, you know, it's as far as we're concerned, it's it's B actor, B bit player versus bit player. He comes back, is disappointed when Guthrun actually marries Thorkell, and of course Thorkell, her fourth husband, is a powerful, wealthy man. He owns, by the way, Skoldlinger, which was the sword of Bolver Kraki, king of that legendary saga. And of course, eventually Thorkell drowns just as her dream foretold. This is all skipping from about chapter 49 to about chapter 78. But the intervening chapters are, like I said, they're all about these bit players. And if you're interested in that, check it out. But it's just not part of the main gist of the saga. Anyway, toward the end of Guthrun's life, her son, Bully, uh, from her husband, Bully, asks her which of her husband's she loved most. And, and husband and man are the same wor word in Old Norse, so he could mean other lovers like Kjartan here. And she famously says, Thame varak verst, erik unamest. I was worse to the one I loved most. And whoever that is, I tend to think it's Kjartan, uh, that has remained one of the most memorable lines of Norse literature. So there's a quick run through of Lakstila saga. One of the most meandering sagas, but that's at least its main storyline. I hope that's been somewhat interesting or enjoyable for you. And from beautiful, incredibly windy Colorado, let me wish you all the best. The whole point of this video channel, the whole point of my books, is to bring good information about these subjects to the people who want it in the places where they're looking for it online.
Otherwise, the people who know what they're talking about are all trying to impress each other, talking to each other in the ivory tower, and they're never reaching out to the public. The people who are reaching out to the public on YouTube or wherever else mostly are scared, angry people sh trying to, to, to spread centuries-old cartoonish uh, racialist theories it, and, and crazy mysticism that has nothing to do with our medieval sources. I want to bring good information about our real medieval sources straight to you in the places where you're looking for it without an agenda, without trying to set myself up as some ivory tower super genius who's better than you. You can help me do that by donating small monthly amounts on my Patreon. And everyone who does that has my everlasting thanks for your incredible generosity and the way that you help me make a university of uh, my favorite place in the world, the Great Rocky Mountain Outdoors. Well, from now, from the middle of beautiful Colorado, let me wish you good thinking, good skepticism, and all the very best. <laughs>